Um, I have been guilty in the past of being super gracious and encouraging to the moms, and then on Father's Day, just pummeling the dads, right? And so I'm like, okay, I need to be helpful, I need to be hopeful, I need to be encouraging to the dads as well, because being a dad can be extremely difficult. And we can say, well, amen to that, right? And then also being a father, being a dad can be extremely rewarding. Some of my most precious memories are of my children in their various stages from the first moment. And I remember this moment crystally clear in my mind as a, how old was I? I was 22 years old, barely old enough to tie my own shoes and now having, having a, a child. And I remember uh, the first time after my wife did the hard work, and thank you ladies for making us dads, right? Woo! And I'm sweater webbing, but I'm gonna tell that. I, I, I think when, when, it's, uh, when it's my birthday, I thank my mom because she's the one that made it possible. All I did was show up, but she did the labor, right? And thank you, mom, thank you, parents. But I remember holding our daughter Anna for the first time, you know, and she was just the length of, length of my, my forearm here and looking in her eyes. You guys remember this when you do this, you know, at the first time? And I saw her eyes and I was done, <laughs> completely done. And, you know, there's a bonding that happens with our, our children that's special and is uh, holy, it's holy and it's wonderful. And so it is an honor to be a, a parent. It is an honor to be a father. And uh, this day brings with it often lots of different emotions, and Margie mentioned that. Some of us have wonderfully fond memories of our fathers, and we are grateful for those memories. Some of us um, had fathers that were um, less than perfect, let's put it that way, and there's pain associated with that. Some of us are, are fathers here, and there is some type of disconnect with our own children, and that's painful as well. And so there's lots of mixes of emotions, but I think it is right to honor dads and to honor moms and to honor parents for what they do and who they are to us. And so we are in the middle of a series on the book of Proverbs. And the text that I chose this morning is not from Proverbs, we're just pausing, but it is of Solomon. If you don't know this, that in the book of Psalms, um, Solomon wrote two of them. One psalm is Psalm 72, and in that psalm, you can see in it, it's a prayer of Solomon as he was entering into the kingdom. So Solomon was a king, and we are looking at his book in Proverbs, but he also wrote some of these psalms. And so it is a prayer, Psalm 72, of Solomon asking God to help him and to bless him and to encourage him and to strengthen him and to be with him as he entered into the ministry and the office of being king over the nation of Israel, God's people at that time. The other psalm that he wrote is a psalm we're going to focus on this morning. It is Psalm 127. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to it. It is Psalm 127. And it's a short psalm that focuses in on three primary things. On a name, his name, okay, this type of legacy. Second, on his work. And thirdly, on his family. And it's a psalm that is easily memorized because the images are quite strong. And you'll see, in particular, in the first set of verses, a word that is there called vanity or vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. And he uses that word multiple times in the first couple verses. And it reminds me of another book that Solomon wrote. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? And if you have not re uh, read that book for a while, I encourage you to do so, along with the book of Lamentations, and no, no, or uh, uh, all the books, I'll just put this, but uh, <laughs> to read the books, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about the, the, jo the jive that Gordon gave us last week about, uh, what book was it? Leviticus, that's it. Read the book of Levit Leviticus as well, okay? <laughs> But the book of Ecclesiastes in it talks a lot about 
um, how vain this life is. And this King Solomon goes through the book, and he's describing all of our various pursuits, from building kingdoms, to building buildings, to building families, to all the pursuits of pleasure, and of work, and of food, and all of these things. And often he'll say, vanity, vanity, all these things are vain. But at the very end of that book, he sums up his thoughts. The end of, here's the end of the matter. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Here's the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And when we read Psalm 127 this morning, you'll see this reflection. And I imagine that Solomon wrote this psalm at the end of his life, as he looked back upon what he had done in his life, and he realized a few things are vain unless the Lord is in it, unless the Lord is a part of it. And so I want us to focus on this psalm from that lens, a wise man who accomplished so many things and reflecting upon what was done, and that will help us with wisdom to know how we are to live our life, and that we would not, at the end of our life, look back and say how vain this was. And so we want to keep the Lord our focus, and that's the encouragement for today. And so you'll see this phrase in these three points, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. And we're going to talk about how to do that and why that's important. So the first main point this morning is honor the Lord in your life. Okay, so this is Psalm 127, starting, of course, with verse 1. So it starts a song of ascent of Solomon. And these were written as the pilgrims were going to the city of Jerusalem, the temple in which Solomon helped to build. Okay, and so as they're going up, Solomon, as they're going, approaching the house of the Lord, wrote these words for us. He starts this way, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Let's stop right there and talk about that. Now, the house in view is not a physical structure. This is not written towards carpenters, laborers, stone builders who are physically building a house, even though that could be a part of it. What he was talking about as a king was he talking about the house of. For instance, like Solomon's dad, the house of David, or the house of Solomon. He was talking about a legacy. This is my house, or this is my reputation, or this is what is given to me as my family and my life unfolds. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. God gave us the good gift of work. How do you like that? Right? Having work, having satisfying work, is a gift of God. If you read Genesis and you notice that the curse of Adam and Eve and then to us as their descendants did not come, okay, or came after God blessed them with a gift of work, okay? So gift uh, for, so work is a gift for each and every one of us. And so we are given the ability and the desire and the satisfaction from working. And so there is labor that you and I have opportunity to give ourselves to. However, if the Lord is not in our labor, our labor comes to nothing. Have you ever worked on a project all day for maybe months and then realized that it all was a failure? done it, right? Worked all day, and I had an engine that I was working on when I was a young man, and trying to put it all together. Sweat and bloody knuckles and oil in my eyes, and you go to start it, and you realize, what's wrong? 
bad engine. So we have to go do it again and again and again. That's discouraging. It is overwhelming. It is um, undoing it sometimes. And Solomon is saying, hey, listen, in your labor, if you want it to count for something in your household, make sure that the Lord is center of it. Now, wanting a legacy is not a bad thing. Because each and every one of us, be it a man or a woman, will leave some type of reputation behind us. And we have to recognize that Having or wanting a good reputation is a good thing. And if other people build monuments to you, that could be a, a blessing. For instance, we drive down some roads that are Martin Luther King Parkway or Drive in honor of that man. Or we have the Washington Memorial. Or where I went to college, there was a fine arts center that was named for Mrs. Titino who gave and gave and gave and gave, and they honored her. Being honored for your life is a good thing, and I hope that others honor it. But sometimes people like to honor themselves, and they will only give money to a university if they put their name in stone, right? I'll only give money if you name this park for me, or if you name this hospital for me, or if you name this all for me. And so there's a difference between honoring ourselves and having others honor us. So dads, in particular, moms also, I want to encourage you, in your labor, let it count for something. In order for it to count for something, the Lord has to be the one who builds it? You see people who build a life and try to build a lasting legacy and put their name on something. If the Lord isn't in it, in the end, it will crumble and it will fall and it will be forgotten. If you honor the Lord, the Lord will honor you. And we don't honor the Lord to be honored. We honor the Lord because he's worthy of honor. And so it's the little things that we can do as parents and dad that you can do as a parent. From bowing down to tie a shoe to bowing down to give glory to God. From working hard at the job regardless if anyone is looking or not by showing up on time, by giving yourself to learn whatever skill or trade or occupation you give yourself to. By when you arrive home, now you take off your worker hat and you put on your dad hat. And it's not time to be just about you. It's time now to go to your real occupation and give your time to your spouse and give your time to your children to embrace them, to know them, to bless them. When I grew up, um, when I was young, I da my dad, James Dennis Spooner, um, was a, a good dad. I appreciated his um, times and some of my special memories are when my dad took a little Nerf football, right? And we would go in our backyard and he would throw the football to me time and time and time again. I remember birthday parties together with my dad, and I have some photos of the 70s where my collar was bigger than my shoulders, right? That's what they put me in. Some of my precious memories, my, my dad and my birthday is just a day apart, is remembering those times. Some of my precious memories of my dad was when we went camping almost every weekend, and we would set up the old canvas tents, right, with the poles, and I kid you not, we could be in the middle of a drought, but once we put one pole to another, it would start to rain, right? <laughs> Cure for any drought was the spooners going camping, right? <laughs> we put this up with headlights and with bugs, and, you know, this was before we had these great tents that are, you know, completely watertight. I grew up 
in a continual rainstorm, it felt like, right? Sleeping with floating ants and debris. But my dad was there, and he was consistent, and we caught fish, and we cleaned them, we built campfires, we did all of those things. My dad brought us to the house of the Lord each and every Sunday, and Sunday night, and Wednesday, and Tuesday night, we were there. And so over time, my dad was a chemical dependency counselor, and he felt that the Lord called him into ministry. And so we left, we were in Minnesota, then we went over to Connecticut, and in Connecticut we went down to Springfield, Missouri, for him to attend, uh, finish his degree, a Bible school degree, and go into ministry. And I was about, hmm, let's see, 10, 11, 12 years old. And the unfortunate and tragic fact was that even in Bible school, my dad drifted away from the Lord. And as he was working in the hospital, Cox Medical Center, as a chemical dependency counselor, he drifted from the Lord and from his commitment to my mom and found another lady. And in that, um, what's the word, denial of his wedding vows, it rocked my world. It rocked my two younger brothers' world. It completely undid us. And I remember um, one day that my mom told us that we're moving, and in 24 hours we were packed in the car. And I remember driving away from uh, a little house in Missouri and my dad sitting on the steps crying as we drove up to Minnesota. And the next two decades, um, my dad, and I dearly love my dad, and he passed away um, 11 years ago. Um, the next two de decades of his life, and he, he would tell you the same thing, he tried to find a religion that justified his lifestyle. <laughs> Going away from Christianity, joining uh, a church called Unity, which really is a cult, that any God that you want is good enough, just pick one and it's all good. And I remember him coming to birthdays, I remember him uh, when he came to birthdays and various things. Um, and there would be another woman, and there would, the next time there'd be another woman, and the next time there'd be uh, another woman. And I remember him having to check into chemical dependency counseling himself as he became addicted to the things he counseled people against. Two decades of time that was wasted because he fell into the trap of saying, well, I'm going to do what I want to do because it's about me and those decades were lost gratefully by the grace of god he came back to faith when he was older and he was rebaptized rededicated and with tears in his eyes we had conversations and um, near his death i took lots of notes i interviewed him literally for three days uh, he told me live your life for the glory of god because that's what all that's the only thing that matters in the end and so dads, I want to encourage you, and moms, I want to encourage you to say, what are you building your life on? What are you building your quote-unquote reputation on? What are you giving yourself to? Are you saying, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and giving yourself to that, or are you not? I want to encourage you who are giving yourself to serving God. You're here in this room today, right? Know that everything you do in the name of the Lord will last in eternity. Be encouraged by that. And sometimes you feel like it's vain. And sometimes you feel like you've fallen flat. And sometimes we fall flat. But I want to encourage you with saying, unless the Lord builds the house, your labor is in vain. So put your hope, put your trust, put your honor in the Lord and trust him for your house. Secondly, we'll see a similar refrain from this psalm. This is Psalm, again, 127, the second part of verse 1. Honor the Lord in your work. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman Stay awake in vain. Now, why do I put this into a city? Well, part of Solomon's job was to build a city. 
the city of Jerusalem at that time. He expanded it and expanded the kingdom. So this was his job, was to build a nation, to build a country, to build a city. So this was his work. And none of us in this place are a king, but you have been given work to do. And so part of our life is seen in our reputation, and we'll see the family, of course, in the next verses, and part of our life is in our work. We give a lot of time to our work, a lot of effort to our work, a lot of energy to our work. But if the Lord doesn't watch over it, our work will crumble to nothing, right? And we can give our time, and we can give our attention, and we can try to protect it. But unless the Lord is watching over it, unless the Lord protects it, what we do comes down to nothing. We work and we slave and we, we try to make something of ourselves. But it will be in vain if we are not honoring the Lord in it. Unless the Lord watches over the city... No matter what you do, is going to come down. So in your work, what are you doing? In your work, what are you looking to honor? In your work, are you paying attention because you know you're working unto the Lord? I've said this multiple times, and I don't remember if I've said it in this building, but I would love it if employers would come to the door of the church knocking and saying, hey, do you have anybody here who needs a job? Because I know that these people in this place are wonderful workers. Wouldn't that be great if the companies in this community would first and foremost go to the churches? Hello, do you have anyone here that needs work? And it's, it's interesting to me, even our mayor of this city, now, because he's been meeting with church leaders for the time he's been in office, and bless him for that, he sends out an email to the churches, first and foremost, saying, here are job opportunities. Will you post these things? That is good news. But I want your life, and God wants your life to count for something. So when you go to work tomorrow, when you go to work perhaps even this evening, when you go to work, you're not there just to earn a paycheck, but you are there to honor the Lord. Whether you're a mechanic, whether you work out in, in the fields, whether you work in a high-rise office building, regardless, it's more than just a paycheck, but it's honoring God, it's honoring your family Say, God, will you make something of us? And so we see in these verses, <laughs> unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, protects the, protects, the, protects the work, excuse me, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And then he continues on, and he says this, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. Eating the bread of anxious toil. Has any of you ever been anxious before? Right? Thank you. Right? This is all of us. Anxious, 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 anxious. Have I done enough? What about this situation? What about that situation? How are the bills going to be played? Oh, I am so tired. Right? And he continues on with an amazing verse. The next part of this verse, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Doesn't that sound good, right? Perhaps you just want to lay out on the pew and rest right now. Sleep, oh glorious. Sleep. I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of anxious nights where I am thinking about my work, or thinking about my children, or thinking about the church, or thinking about something anxious, and it's robbed me of rest. 
I once saw a t-shirt that I would like to get that says, Jesus took naps. Be like Jesus. I can identify with that, right? Yeah. Thank you. Ever thought <laughs> Jesus, who had the weight of his shoulder, weight of the world on his shoulders? He took naps. <laughs> remember that story where um, the disciples were in the boat? Remember that, right? His main men were around him. They were going across the lake. Jesus was not in front of the boat commanding them where to go. He was in the back, down below, it says on a cushion, <laughs> asleep. And remember the disciples, they were becoming anxious about this storm. And yes, some of them were tax collectors, some of them were people who worked on land, but many of them were fishermen. They knew the lake. They knew storms. They knew boats. They knew what to do. But even they became anxious. And they went down below and said, Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus replied to them, Oh, you of little... Why was Jesus able to sleep in the middle of the storm? <laughs> because he trusted. He knew that his life was in the hand of his father. That's a beautiful thing about kids, especially young kids, especially if you have a good relationship with them. I remember when I was... Um, in a boat with my dad, and we were in a sailboat on Lake Superior, biggest body of water I've ever seen. And my brother and I were in the boat, we're probably, how old, six or seven. And my dad and his friend were out top, and this massive storm came in. And the boat was rocking. And there's, there's these little windows of the sailboat, little windows kind of up top. And I remember, man, seeing one side of the lake and then seeing the other side of the lake in the, uh, in the windows, and I was scared. But the thing that gave me peace was knowing it's going to be okay because my dad's here. My dad will take care of it. And my dad will know what to do. There's sometimes where perhaps you and I know me, I feel like that little child again. God, this, this is rocking. There's a storm that's happening that's bigger than me. But, Father, I know it's going to be okay because you're here. You will work it out. And I trust in you. And I can be okay. The Lord gives his beloved, his children, rest and sleep and you and I can rest and sleep not because we're enough but because he is enough right? he continues to work and he gives us rest because he loves us it's also interesting to note when you read the book of Genesis right from the beginning when God describes the day it uses this these words it was evening and it was morning the first day. Now we in the Western world would think it would be written, it was morning, then it was evening, the first day. Because we think that the day starts when we get up. In God's way of looking at time and a day, the day starts when we go to sleep. He wants to give us rest First, the Jewish understanding of time, even to this day, is that a new day starts at 6 p.m., time that you're getting ready to go to bed. 
I want you, and I realized that this week, and I started to think about my day a little bit differently. As I go to bed, God, thank you for the day that just happened, and God, thank you for this day that is starting now. And thank you that I can sleep first to get the energy I need to go about the tasks of the daylight. And even last night, as I was falling asleep, as my mind started to think about this circumstance or this situation or my children, God, I thank you that I can sleep in peace because you got this. Solomon, the man who wrote this psalm, talked to God, and we know this wisdom encounter when he was asleep. God is working when we are resting because he is good to us. Some of us just need a nap. Some of you are weary, weary, weary. And you're weary because you go and go and go and go and go and go like everything is dependent upon you. Here's the encouragement. It's not all dependent upon you. One of the good gifts of God is that he tells us to stop. Stop. Rest. Enjoy the sleep of God. Sleep sometimes is an act of faith. God, I don't know what to do here. God, you know. God, I don't have the strength. And God says, stop and rest for a while. Trust me. For he gives to his beloved Next stanza, and this is the final point of this passage this morning. Honor the Lord in your family. Now it's interesting as this wise man Solomon is turning from the legacy of his house and coming to realize that unless God's in it, it's going to be for naught. And he looks at his work that has been given and says, unless God is in it, it's going to amount to nothing. And then he turns and he focuses in on his heritage, his reward. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Like Arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man, blessed is the person who fills his quiver with them. He should not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Now the truth is that our children often are a handful before they are a quiverful. <laughs> Amen, Pasta. <laughs> they can be a handful. <laughs> when they're crying and crying and crying at night and you just want them to be quiet. They can be a handful when they learn language and ask incessantly, why? 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 <laughs> and our kids loved reputa- uh, repu- <laughs> what am I going to say? Repeating things. Wow, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired today. Um, repetition, that's the word I'm looking for. Have you ever read the same book about 300 times in a row? So much so that you have it memorized, and they have it memorized, and they know when you skip pages. (laughs) 
or mix up the words. But they want to hear it again. Our kids loved Blue's Clues. You guys remember Blue's Clues? That was fun, right? Veggie Tales, anyone? Can I get a witness? Right. Yeah. This, this was back in the days where we had VCRs. Remember those things? Tape things you put in? Right. And we would have to rewind it again. We got to a point where, you know those um, VCR tapes? It can either have two hours, and if you switch a little switch, they can record up to six hours. We recorded six hours of VeggieTales back to back to back to back to back to back so we wouldn't have to rewind it so often. Sometimes when we go home as parents or grandparents, we just <sighs> want to take a break. And yet our greatest joys and our wonderful responsibilities come running. Daddy, Daddy, you're home. God, give me the strength and the patience and the love to engage at all levels with our kids. And some of you have kids who have kids who have kids. <laughs> We're still parents. Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of a, the womb, a reward. Some of us have kids, some of us wish we had kids. All of us have an opportunity to impart what we are and what we know to others. I've said this to people, and I'm going to say it again, that each one of us need three different relationships. If you're a male, all of us need fathers, someone to look up to. We need brothers, someone to do life with. And we need children to pass on our life and to raise them. And these can be biological children or children that you give yourself to, younger men. We need older men, we need similar age people, and we need younger folks. Same with the ladies. Need Older women to look towards, sisters to do life with, and daughters to pass things on to. We in our lives will fill all of those roles. Sometimes you'll be a parent, sometimes you'll be a brother, sometimes you'll be a son. Well, regardless of what age you are, I will encourage you to look to those and to be a person who is a father, who is a brother, who is a son, who are a mother, who are a sister, who are a daughter. Those relationships matter. And these children are God's gift to us, a reward that help us win the enemy comes to our gate. And the enemy comes in various forms. It can come from a vicious co-worker, or it can come as a vicious disease. It can come from a failed 401k investment, or it can come as a car crash. In those times, those in whom God has entrusted to us, either physical children or children that others who have put into, God has put into our life, come as a protection, come as a shelter, come as an assistance. This is part of God's good blessing to us. So here's my encouragement for us. Number one, <laughs> it's not all dependent upon you. If you're a parent here this day and you are done, here's my advice. 
take a nap. Okay. Seriously. Some of us in this place have felt like you failed. And all of us fail at times. All of us lose our temper. All of us wish that we have done some things differently. Even the best parents among us said, boy, yeah, I wish I would have been there. I wish I wouldn't have said that. I wish I could have done more. I want to encourage you to trust yourself to the grace of God. God is greater than your failures. Point them to Christ. Live to the best of his ability in you. To say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Live in humility, live in peace, and live to honor God. And I would encourage you this day to say, starting from this day, that you say, I'm going to honor God today. That might mean calling up your parents, if they're still around, your dad. And giving honor as you can. It might mean remembering those things. It might mean apologizing. It might mean celebrating. I don't know. But choose to honor the Lord in your life. And I want to honor you for your life. So I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to um, enjoy communion together. Celebrate. Reflect in that way. So let's pray together right now. God, I am grateful. And we are grateful. That all of this doesn't solely and squarely rest on our shoulders. I'm grateful for the men among us. God, that are striving to honor you. God, I know that all of us in some way or form has been wounded wounded in some way. God, I ask for healing for those wounds. God, I ask for strength to endure. God, I ask for love to overflow. And Father, I ask that you would bless in particular fathers this day, but parents and grandparents, moms that have Work so hard, God. Men are working so hard. That when we start a new day by going to sleep, that we would all sleep well. <laughs> because our sleep, and help us, God, for our sleep to be an expression of our faith. That we trust you. And those who are wondering and, and uh, wondering about their kids, and they might have prodigals and kids who don't know you, God, we ask that they would see the good, good Father who is perfect in all of his ways. God, that they would see you through the cracked mirror of our lives, God, that they would catch glimpses of you. And so we pray for our children, God. And we thank you for godly parents, God. We thank you that we can look to you, that you delight in calling yourself a father, and you are a father who is good. We thank you for the perfect son, who lived as a reflection of the very essence and the embodiment of the Father. We honor him this day 
as our brother. And we again place our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen.